Okay, so we have now finished the series on the historical origins of Islam, uh, looking at three areas. We started with Mecca, uh, we then went to Muhammad, and then we ended with the Quran itself. People have asked me to do this for many years because there's so much new material that we're uploading all the time. And so they said, could you encapsulate it in a, in a ongoing set of episodes that, so we can watch it and bring it all together and make sense of it? That's taken quite a few weeks. Now, however, people are asking, hold on a minute, <laughs> that's too many episodes. You've been doing it for the last, all of spring, and now we're into the summertime, and yeah, we're getting, we're, we're having to go back and see what you said earlier to understand what you're saying now. So, this is what I'm going to do. Uh, uh, rather than just put it all into uh, one talk, I'm going to upload a talk I did a few weeks ago for the I. CMDA, International Christian Medical and Dental Association, uh, an organization that asked me to do just this very thing. They wanted to have three talks. Actually, I did a fourth, but I'll get to that later. They wanted me to do three talks on Mecca and on Muhammad and also on the Quran for all of their 60,000 uh, doctors and dentists around the world that are part of ICMDA. And I did just a few weeks ago. So this is hot off the press, you might say. And I went through starting with Mecca, then to Muhammad, then to the Quran in that order. But that's much like I had done also in these series that I've uploaded onto Fander Films. And you'll see why. And I explain it. The man who is going to introduce me and the man who is in charge of ICMDA, Dr. Peter Saunders, is a good friend of mine. We've known each other for many years. When I was living in Britain, I would go and help him out uh, with Christian Medical Fellowship, CMF, which he was president at that time. Uh, and he has been following the whole historical critique, oh my goodness, since around the 1990s, possibly in the early 2000s. And because he has been following it, I really wanted to see what he felt about the newest material. So for him, this was the first time for him hearing it, and he's going to react to that. Because of the questions that came up, and he was reading the questions from the thousands of doctors and dentists who are watching these episodes, uh, these you know, the talks around the world, he picked out the best questions, and at the end of each talk, which is only about a half an hour long, he then threw these questions at me. So I'm going to include them because they're good questions, and I'm sure they're questions that you're asking. So come with us. Let's go ahead and get into it. And I'm going to start with Mecca, and then I'm going to move into Muhammad next. That will be the next episode, and then I'll finish off with the Quran and probably add some added material that I wasn't able to get into the ICMDA seminars. Now, at the very end then, the fourth one I'm going to put up is called the hermeneutical key. Most of you don't know what that's about. It's one of my favorite talks. It's been one that I have been using since the 1900s, uh, the last century. It shows you how old I am. And it's the talk that helps Christians and Muslims understand why we're talking past each other. Why in so many of our theological discussions, we are saying the same words, we seem to be claiming the same claims, and yet we're talking right past the other. We're not. And I'm going to unpack about 13 areas where we're talking past each other. But that's at the very end. That will be the one that will come up after the Quran. So, sit back, enjoy. This is an encapsulation of what I've been doing this spring and this summer in just three talks. Three quick half an hour to 45 minute talks, maybe even an hour, depending on how much I put onto the Quranic material. If you have any questions, you know where to go, right down here. <laughs> Throw them at me and I will certainly go and look at them and maybe even send some to Peter if he wants to also respond. Uh, but let's see what you think. When you see it all together, when it's all in one talk or three talks in this case, let's see if it makes sense to you. Good. This is Jay then. Over and out or over to you. Hello and welcome everybody to ICMDA webinars. I'm Dr. Peter Saunders, the Chief Executive of the International Christian Medical and Dental Association, which brings together about 60,000 Christian doctors and dentists around the world in 84 affiliated national movements. 
And it's my privilege today to introduce uh, Dr. Jay Smith, who's going to be speaking to us on answering Islam, the importance of Mecca. So uh, it's great to have uh, Jay Smith, Dr. Jay Smith, back with us to talk on the subject of understanding Islam as the importance of Mecca. And uh, Muslim tradition teaches that Mecca is uh, the oldest and probably the greatest of all cities, that Adam and Eve were thrown down into it many thousands of years ago, that Abraham lived there, that this city was where Muhammad came from and also where he received the Quran. But what does history and archaeology reveal? And this webinar is going to look at the historical record of Mecca using evidence from the seventh century and before and comparing it with traditional teaching. And, and uh, a lot of this may be new to you. This is uh, new material, a lot of which has only really come up through scholarship in the last uh, few decades or so. Dr. Jay Smith is eminently qualified to speak about this. He's worked with Muslims since 1983. He's got two master's degrees and he completed his PhD in Islamics in the areas of apologetics and polemics in 2017. Jay is one of Christianity's principal public evangelists and debaters to the Muslim world. He travels extensively uh, teaching apologetics for those exploring ministry to Muslims, and he engages the movers and thinkers of Islam on a weekly basis. So he's uh, very much, a, a, as well as being an academic, is very much hands-on in dialogue. He is the founding member of the Hyde Park Christian Fellowship in London, a very popular venue where you can go along and stand on, on ladders and platforms and engage and, and hear all sorts of speakers. And uh, also, um, he is co-founder for the Fanda Center for Apologetics, which is something of an internet sensation as well, with a lot of uh, new material being debated. So, Jay, it's a real pleasure to have you back here on ICM Day webinars, old friend, and we really look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Over to you. Thank you. Thanks, well, uh, Peter. It's been a many years that we've worked together and it's great to see you again and great to be here amongst all these doctors, nurses, and dentists. Uh, this is uh, CMF when I was there in Britain for 25 years, the many times that you and I uh, not only engaged, but also that we were able to introduce a lot of this new material. So let me jump right into it. We're going to, I'm going to have a PowerPoint uh, and I want to, I want to uh, look specifically at the importance of Mecca historically. That's the title that we're giving to today's talk, looking at the newest research on these, uh, on the historicity. And we're going to look at three areas through these talks, three different talks. We're going to look at Mecca today, then we'll move into an assessment uh, of the sources of early Islam. And then on the third week that uh, I'll be back, We'll unpack and look at the historical assessment of the Quran, which will probably be the most exciting of the three because it is it has the most material and it's probably the one that everybody's talking about at the moment. So let's get right into what we know as a standard Islamic narrative. These are the Islamic traditions. This is what Muslims need to know how every day of their life, how to walk, talk, eat, drink, sleep, they must go to the Islamic tradition, standard Islamic narrative to find out what they're to do. Now, according to those traditions, according to the traditional claims that all Muslims make, except possibly the liberals, but all the radicals and nominals and everybody in between, 99.9% .9 of all Muslims would make, is that for the last 1400 years, Muhammad was the last and greatest prophet who was born in Mecca in 570 AD and died in Medina in 632 AD. He is the one that modeled Islam for the world, and he is the one that received the Quran. This, that Quran, his revelation, was sent down to him between 610 and 632 AD, so it is the final, the greatest, and the only perfectly preserved revelation, and it is sent down to correct the previous revelations, which according to the standard narrative, had been corrupted. Therefore, Islam is the final religion, according to this uh, traditional claims, based on Muhammad's life and sayings, that would be in the Sunnah, and on the Quran's teaching. So, if that is the case, conclusion, Islam is therefore completely dependent 
on three things, the book, the man, and the place. The book being the Quran, the man being Muhammad, and the place, Mecca. Since these three areas are foundational to Islam, therefore it is incumbent upon us to investigate them. And we want to investigate them at the time they all existed, which is the seventh century, and in the place they existed, which is that central part of Arabia known as the Hejaz, where Mecca and Medina were located. So let's start by looking at the history of Mecca itself. Now, why is Mecca? Why am I starting with Mecca? Why am I doing it backwards? Usually you start the book, the man, the place. I'm going to place the man and the book. I'm going backwards. And the reason I'm starting with Mecca is that Islam is dependent on these three things, like a stool with three legs. There you see the Mecca, Muhammad, and the Quran. Islam is dependent on all three for it to have any authority. When you begin to uh, confront Mecca, just that one leg, the other two begin to wobble. But once you destroy that place, you then destroy the other two as well. Because you take away one leg, the whole edifice falls down. So let's begin by looking in, at the world in the 7th century. And when you look in the 7th century, this is the map that the standard Islamic narrative gives us. This is not my map. This is the map that Islam gives us. And they would say that Muhammad's empire included that brown area that I'm pointing to right there. So that would include Mecca and Medina. Do you see the two cities there? He died in 632, according to the narrative. And then once he died, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali took over. And that would be known as the Rashidun period. So you have Abu Bakr from 632 to 634, Umar from 634 to 644, Uthman from 644 to 656, and then Ali from 656 to 661. That's how Islam expanded into the orange area, which I'm pointing to right now. When Ali was killed in, at the Battle of Sifan in 661, Mu'uwiyah takes over, and that begins the Umayyad Caliphate. That then moved into what we know is the purple area. See the purple area. So by the time the Umayyads... Uh, the Umayyads come to power in 661 up until 749 or 750, as I have on the map, that purple area. By 750, when the Abbasids come to power, all that area that you see in brown, orange, and purple were under, their, under Islam's control. That includes from Andalusia all the way to Afghanistan, from Turkey all the way down to Yemen today. Those are the countries today. But I'm interested in the brown area, in the brown area and, and bits of the orange area. That's all that I'm interested in today's talk. So let's unpack and see what we can find. Looking at a historical assessment of Mecca. Now, why Mecca? It's where everything is in, in Islam has happened, as Peter said. Therefore, the book and the man are absolutely dependent on Mecca. If it did not exist, then neither did the other two. Oh, there may have been other Muhammads or there may have been other Qurans, but not in Mecca, not the one from Mecca. Okay, I hope you understand that. Once you confront Mecca in the 7th century, then you also confront Muhammad and the Quran in the 7th century historically, at least the Muhammad and the Quran of Islam, the ones we have today. So what do they claim about this place? Well, according to Surah and that's the chapter 7, verse 24. Mecca is where Adam and Eve were thrown down to from the Garden of Eden. Yeah. And then according to chapter 21, verse 51 to 71 in the Quran, Abraham lived there and destroyed the idols. Mecca, according to the trade route theory and that which we get out of the standard narrative, was a center of trade, north, south, east, and west. So it should be one of the best known and best documented places on history. It's the oldest city in history because you don't get any older than adam and eve obviously therefore it's important according to the quran itself it's the first sanctuary appointed to mankind now it doesn't say the word mecca it says baka in chapter 3 verse 96 the mother of settlements according to chapter 6 it was where adam and eve went to as i said earlier in chapter 7 abraham lived there as i said earlier in chapter 21 where muhammad was born in 6 and lived until 622 and was the center of the Qibla. That's the direction of all the mosques from 624 on. And chapter 2, verse 149 to 150 says that. 
The above implied people had lived there from the very beginning. Yet the only reference we find to Mecca, the city itself in the Quran, is one surah, one verse, only one verse, chapter 48, verse 24. All these other references talk about the place of the prophet, the mother of the settlements, uh, where Adam and Eve lived. It doesn't give the word Mecca in the Quran. That's curious if it's such an important city. Look at the vegetation that the traditions refer to. Now, by this time, when the traditions are written in the 9th and 10th century, Mecca was well known. So in that place, they say this had a, it was had a valley and a parallel valley. It had stream. It was where the pillar of salt was, where uh, Lot's wife turned to salt. It had fields, trees, grass, fruit, clay, loam, olive trees. Folks, that looks like a, a very ver uh, place with a lot of verdure, a lot of fruit. It does not look like the desert that you see Mecca is and has always been. Mecca has always been much too arid to support the above. So when you look at geographical references, only nine places are named in the Quran. But what's interesting is three of them come up over and over and over again. This prophet, who's only named four times in the Quran, this prophet has contact, almost daily contact with these people from Ad. That's the biblical ooze. 23 times Ad is referred to in the Quran. 24 times the people of Thamud, that's the Nabataeans as we know them, who cut dwellings into mountains. Seven times he has contact with these people from Midian. Those are the Midianites. Look at the map on the right. Look where Ad is, look where the Thamud is, and look where Midian. That's 600 miles further north than Mecca. So how could this prophet, if he's living in Mecca, how could he have daily contact with people that are 600 miles further north, unless, of course, he had an airplane or a helicopter, which I don't think existed in the 7th century. When you look at the Quran and you look at the Arabic that's in the Quran, note that the Arabic grammatical borrowings, almost all of the Irabs, the, 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 what you see in the Quran, these are inflectional short final vowels marked with diacritics. These are found in the Quran today, but they didn't exist in the Arabic used in the Hijaz, where the green box is. This tarmar buta that we have uh, that gives the ta sound at the end of the word, that is uh, found in Arabic in the red uh, rectangle, which is way up north, Nabataean, Aramaic. That's where the tarmar buta is written, but it's in the Quran today. So therefore, whoever wrote the Quran could not have been living in the Hijaz. The Aleph Maksura, that the, the, the looks like an S at the Ya sound at the end of the words. That is also from Arabic that was way up in the southern Levant in Nabataea. The definite article, the, introducing a following consonant consonant, that is only found in Nabataean, yet it's right through the Quran, suggesting very clearly that the Quran we have in our hand today did not come from Mecca, Medina. It came from much further north. Sabaic Arabic is what they would have used in the Meccan Medina. Now, the Sabaic Aramaic comes from Yemen, and it existed since 600 BC. It does not have the Tadmar Butta or the Al of Maksura or the definite article. Therefore, the Quranic Arabic, which is made up of Nabataean Aramaic, existed 600 miles further north, while the 7th century Arabic of Mecca in the Hijaz, known as Sabaic, would have accommodated the text of the Quran had it been used eradicating the Kid'at problems, which we're going to talk about in three weeks. Just bring that, keep that under your hat for now because that don't want to get into it. When you look at the prophets, according to the traditions, according to Islamic narrative, look at all the prophets that were buried in Mecca. When you, are when you die, you are buried within 24 hours. Adam and Eve, Seth, Ishmael, Noah, Hud, Saleh, Queen of Sheba, Daniel, almost 300 other prophets all lived or died and were buried. Almost all of them, according to traditions, kneeling in a, in a praying position so that their bodies would not deteriorate. That means they should be there today. Yet when you look at all the buildings being built around the Kaaba today, that's the fourth highest building in the world, that clock tower you're looking at. Look at all the 62 large skyscrapers they're now building there. You build skyscrapers and building that high, you have to dig deep into the ground. So what have they found with all these diggings? They should find these bodies. They have not found one body. If the above were true, this would mean that almost all of the Bible would have to be rewritten and all of the stories be redirected 600 to 1,000 miles further south. Yet there is so much evidence for biblical narrative historically, yet almost nothing for Islams. The first reference we find 
for the name Mecca is not till 741 on the apocalypse of pseudo Methodius Continuato Byzantia Arabica. Folks, that's over 100 years after Muhammad supposedly died. Can you see a problem, folks? The earliest map that we have with Mecca on it is not till the 10th century, not till 900 AD. Speaking of maps, let's take a look at Ptolemy's maps from the second century. These are a series of Ptolemy's maps that were recreated later on by Europeans, Leinhard Holy, taking what Ptolemy said in his geography of Arabia. Remember, he didn't have a map himself. He just would list different cities and places, mountains and rivers. And this is the map that Leonard Holy put together in 1482. Notice Mecca is not there. Here's another map put together by Laurent Fries in 1541. Notice Mecca's not there as well. Here's another map put together by Sebastian Munster in 1571. Again, Mecca is missing on all these maps. This is a 7th century redacted map that was made recently. And notice Mecca's not on that map because Ptolemy never knew it existed. He never had it listed anywhere in the 2nd century. Another one from the 7th century. Notice Mecca is nowhere to be found. Why, therefore, is it not to be found? Well, let's look at the Kiblis. The Kiblis, this is uh, Dan Gibson did all this material uh, from 1987 up to 2005, and he went to all the, over 100 mosques looking for their Qibla wall. That's the direction of prayer. According to chapter 2 of the Quran, uh, all the Qibla was redirected down to Mecca, although it doesn't give the word Mecca, it's just as the Masjid al-Haram, which means the, the forbidden place of bowing. And it was at that time, uh, about 624, 621, excuse me, that all the mosques were there for, therefore facing Mecca. Hold on a minute. Every mosque that he was able to find from the 7th century, look at Medina, Guangzhou in China, Sherman in India, Jami Ahmad in, in, in Syria, in Egypt, in Israel, in Jordan, in Yemen, all of these mosques from hundreds of miles, thousands of miles away are all facing Mecca. Petra in Jordan. Not one mosque is facing Mecca in the 7th century. They only begin to start facing Mecca in the 8th century from 715 to 725. That is almost 100 years too late, proving that even the archaeology supports the fact that Mecca did not exist as a viable place, certainly not in the 7th century. When we look at the trade route theory, the Montgomery Walk, put together in the last century to support why Mecca was important. He said, when you look at the trade in the ancient world, it all came from mostly China and India, couldn't go across the Hindu Kush or the Himalayas. So it came across uh, from the Western coast of India, across the Arabian Sea, up through the Persian Gulf, just follow the Red Arrows, up to what is today Basra, went across what is today Iraq, uh, and over into Syria, into Lebanon, into Israel, what is today Lebanon and Israel, over into the Mediterranean world. That's where the trade route went until the 5th century. In the 5th century, then the Sassanians, who are the Persians, started battling with the Byzantines, who are the Christians. Uh, the Sassanians would be Zoroastrian. And their battles that were happening for 200 years, from the 5th 6th and 7th century shut down that trade. No longer could the trade go that route. So it had to be redirected. Montgomery Watt said this is what happened. It got redirected down this way across the Arabian Sea to Aden and then from Aden zip all the way up to Gaza in the north 1250 miles away across the Western Plateau, and there is Mecca halfway. And so therefore Mecca controlled the trade. That's what made Mecca great is what he's saying. Dr. Patricia Krone, head of a department at Oxford University, wrote a book called Meccan Trade and the Rise of Islam. This woman reads and writes 15 archaic languages, probably the most formidable scholar on Mecca, and no one has equaled her, uh, and she went back to all the trading documents and decided to ask a question, because she noticed there were two problems. First and foremost, this, this, there was this problem. She said, hold on a minute, if you're coming down across the Arabian Sea, and you take off all your goods there at Aden, and you go to Aden up to Najran, and Sana, Sana, then Najran, then to Taif, there that way, from Taif, which all of those are up on the Western Plateau, but then you got to go down off the Western Plateau, 3,000 feet down to Mecca. Do you see the detour there? 
And then from Mecca, if it existed, you then have to go up another 3,000 feet to get to Yathrib, which today is now called Medina, which is on the Western Plateau. And then from Yathrib on up to Khaibar, Tabuk, and then of course to Gaza, Petra, and then Gaza in the north. Do you see the detour? You can see it on uh, the map I'm showing you here. There's a definite detour. That would not make sense, she said, because Mecca had no water. If Mecca has no water, then what's the purpose of having trade go down to it? And it's a desert. So she said, hold on a minute. Let's see what the trading documents say. But here's another problem. If you're on water to begin with from Western India, coming across the Arabian Sea, why don't you stay on water? Look at this. Look at the Red Sea that's there. The Red Sea is water. Why would you take it off water, which is the cheapest way to send any goods? Even today, you can take a ton of goods and only go 50 miles by land. It would cost the same amount as 1,250 miles by sea. So why in the world are they taking it off at Aden? You have to protect it. Uh, the, the camels, you have to feed the camels, you have to water the camels, and anybody can attack you from behind hills or rocks or mountains or even sand dunes. But on the sea, you don't have to feed anybody because it's the wind that pushes you. It's free. It's, it's, it's free energy. More than that, you can see another boat for miles away. That's why everything is done by sea. And she said, went back to the trading documents, and this is what she found. It did not go through Arabia at all. It went this route, came across the Arabian Sea. Yes, it probably did stop at Aden to get goods and also get on water, but then went right up the Red Sea down to Agilis. Agilis is in Eritrea today. That is Eritrea today. And then from Agilis, and Agilis is found in all of the trading documents, they control the trade. And from there, went up the Red Sea, up to Petra, and then from Petra to Gaza, and then from Gaza, right out over the Mediterranean Sea. So that was the trade route she found. She got a death threat for finding this material in 1987. Had to leave Oxford and go to Cambridge University, where I met her, and then she helped me with my first debate in 1995 on this material. So I've known this for over 25 years. This is nothing new, folks. But she made one mistake. She didn't go far enough. Something new about the Red Sea. She didn't really do enough study on the Red Sea because why did they stop in Agilis? Possibly, why couldn't they have gone to the right side of the Red Sea and got up to what is Jeddah? Jeddah today, and also which fed would have fed Mecca. Why could not that? So we decided to do some research on my team and we um, looked at this topographical map from space, looking down onto the Red Sea. There you can see Yanbu, which was the town that fed Yathrib. And according, and today, Jeddah, which is there today, is where you get all the provisions for Mecca, because Mecca is a desert. It has no water. It has no verdure. That's why you needed to have Jeddah. So everybody comes back to me and says, that's what was the, how Mecca existed. Here's a problem. Take a look at that dark channel right in the middle of the Red Sea. Now, let me put it in, I'll put a red mark over top of it. There's the red channel there. That's where large ships go. It's deep. Uh, our large super tankers go there today, but you didn't, they didn't have super tankers in the seventh century. They would have used small boats that had sails. And so they went, would go on these channels. See those channels there? That's the channels that the small boats took. Notice where they're sitting. They're on the western side of the Red Sea. They're on the African coast. Unlike the Eastern Arabian show, the eastern side, which was arid with no fresh water and thus few people, the West African shore had plenty of fresh water and had larger populations. What's more, the West Coast had easily accessible ports, and we know their names. Folks, take a look at the ports. When you look at the ports on the West Coast of the Red Sea in Africa, there are three, Asab, which is in Eritrea today, Agilis, which is in Eritrea today, when you also have Swakin, which is in Sudan, and then you have Berenice, which is in Egypt, followed by Safaga, in Egypt, those are the five major ports along the Red Sea. They're all on the west. They're all on the African coast. Their dates, look at the dates, 246 BC, 79 AD, 170 AD, 275 BC, 282 BC. These all predate Islam. 
And notice they are all equidistant. They are all five days boat ride apart so that the boat could go in every day and stay overnight, get its food, get its provisions to go to the next port. That's why you have the them equal distance apart. Now, on the Red Sea, Eastern Arabian coast, only Yanbu is known historically. We only have reference to Yanbu as Yathrib's port city. What about Jeddah as a port for Mecca, which is you would have been used today? Dr. Uh, Hawking, Dr. Gerald Hawking has written about Jeddah, and he says that there is no history of Jeddah or Mecca until the 8th century. It did not exist until the 8th century, over 100 years after Muhammad. Why? For one very simple reason, neither had water, nor a population large enough to accommodate early trade. Whoop, let's get rid of those two then, because historically, those two did not exist in the 7th century. Without Mecca, what then happens to 7th century Islam? Well, it pretty well eradicates any notion that there could have been any activity, any trade, or anyone in those cities that early. Let me just give you and show you... Um, a map, a topographical map to really underline this. There is Aden, here you have Sana, there you have Najran, there you have Taif, now you have Yathrib, from there you have Tabuk, and then we have Petra, and then Gaza. That is where the trade went. It was a local trade, according to Patricia Corona. It only had mostly leather and, uh, and uh, some incense. That's about it is all they traded. You don't make an empire on leather. What's interesting is notice where they're going. They're all along the Western Plateau. So where is Mecca? Well, looking at a topographical map, look where Mecca is. It's down off the plateau, 3,000 feet. To get a better example, look at this one here. Let's look at a topographical map using line drawings to show you even more exact. So there you have Aden and Sana in what is Yemen. Then we get into Najran and Taif and Tathrib. There you have Tabuk, there you have Petra, and there you have Gaza. So where's Mecca? Bingo, 3,000 feet down, way off the plateau, not on the uh, trade route, shutting down any notion that Mecca was important because of trade. And that completely makes uh, Montgomery Watts trade route theory completely defect. Well, what about the civilizations who are surrounding Mecca? Would they have heard of this place? So let's go and ask that question. Was Mecca known? If Mecca was the oldest city in the history of mankind, then someone somewhere in the area surrounding it should have heard of it, right? So what about those empires which were in that area? And this is material that Dr. Patricia Corona has researched and has written up on her Meccan trade and the rise of Islam. She asked whether she could find any documentation on Mecca in Saba, not a thing, nor in Himyat, nor in Eastern Arabia. She couldn't find anything in Western Arabia. What about the patriarchs? Nothing at all written about Mecca or the Himyarites. The Assyrians knew nothing about Mecca, neither did the Babylonians. Central Western Arabians didn't know about it. The Persian Empire didn't know about this place. The Roman Empire didn't know about this place. Not even Northeastern Africans knew about this place. Folks, take a look at that map. What do you notice? Everyone who was close to Mecca, who are surrounding Mecca from the, before the seventh century, these are all prior to the seventh century, never heard of this city. That right there underlines exactly what we're talking about. You're going to have to, and Muslims are going to have to somehow come up with some type of response to this. Not one of them had heard of Mecca. So the reason probably why I took these four pictures down to Speaker's Corner back in 2019, and I held them up at Speaker's Corner, and I wanted Muslims to look at it, and I want everybody to look at it. I said, what do you notice about Mecca and Medina? Well, take a look. It's uh, in the desert, right? It's pretty clear that the central part of Arabia with Mecca Medina is all a desert. Where there is a desert, there is no water. Where there is no water, there is no food. Where there's no food, there's no people. Where there are no people, there is no town. Where there are no towns, there is no city. Where there is no cities, there is no civilization. Where there is no civilization, there is no history. Just like Mars without water, there is no point in ever going there. So before we get into the Hajj, can you notice how simple this is? How long did it take me to say that? About 10 seconds. You can do the same thing. Anytime they bring about Mecca, just throw, show them a map and say, you've got a problem here. You need to have water. 
let's go to the Hajj and we'll end off with this. The states, stages of the Hajj are mostly borrowed. Here's a picture of the Kaaba with a circumambulation going seven times counterclockwise. Why do they do that? Well, some people have thought maybe it's because they did that in Petra. That's what Dan Gibson came up with. They circumambulated counterclockwise seven times there. But if you want to find the answer, you need to go to Jerusalem. It's Jerusalem where they circumambulated. Josephus talks about this in his book on, on, on the pilgrimage of the Jews. They would come to Jerusalem, uh, where the Dome of the Rock is today, used to be where the Holy of Holy was. That's the Temple Mount and Mount Moriah. It was always called the Temple Mount. So now the Dome of the Rock is sitting right where the Temple Mount is used to be. They would circumambulate seven times going counterclockwise to commemorate what happened in Jericho. That's what God had Joshua do in Jericho. That is why it is they, they just following exactly what the Jews did earlier. Now, and in Mecca, to, if you're a Muslim, after you circumambulate seven times, you then run back and forth between two mountains called Marwa and Safa. There's a picture of Marwa there. There's a picture of Safa. Notice these are not mountains. They're only 20 feet high. Obviously, this was to commemorate Hagar out in the desert. She's been thrown out of the desert. Remember, she lived in Mecca with Abraham. That's where Abraham lived. And he threw her out in the desert. She goes out into the desert and she needs water for Ishmael. She runs back and forth between the two mountains seven times. Finally, when she comes back to where Ishmael is, there is water bubbling out of the ground. That's known as the Zamzam well. Ironically, when you look at these today, these are only rocks. These are not mountains. And the Zamzam well and are, is only about 30 meters from the Kaaba. Here, these two rocks are only about 100 meters from the Kaaba. If she's out in the desert, what's she doing in the middle of Mecca, just a few hundred feet away from the Kaaba? She could have gone to any house and knocked on a door for water. Obviously, these are not the original not Marwa and Safa. These are facsimiles. These are nothing more than models of what was original. Dan Gibson says that the same can be found in Petra, but let's go even earlier. Let's go back to Jerusalem. There is Marwa and Safa in Jerusalem. Marwa is the Arabic name for Mount Moriah. Josephus refers to Marwa as Mount Moriah in Arabic. There it is on the Temple Mount. You go down to the Kidron Valley, come back up to Mount Scopus. Mount Scopus in Arabic is Safa. So the original Marwa, the original Safa that all the Muslims go to today was actually in Jerusalem. That's where the pilgrims would go from Moriah over to Mount Scopus, now in Arabic called Marwa and Safa. So the original Kaaba looks like it comes from Jerusalem. The original Safa and Marwa looks like they come to, from Jerusalem. The hill of Arafat looks like that is from Petra. The three Jamarats uh, in 1991, that is also from Petra. The Zamzam well looks like that comes from the Pool of Siloam in Jerusalem. And the Black Stone. What are we going to do with the Black Stone? I don't have time. That is an absolute anathema for Muslims. What in the world are they kissing a Black Stone right there on the corner of the Kaaba when this is to take away their sins? Only God can take away their sin. This is idolatry at its worst. And that is right in the holiest of holies of Islam. That's for another time for another lecture. Six conclusions concerning Mecca's historical problems. No one could find Mecca placed in the Quran. Crone could not find any maps with Mecca until 980. Gibson introduced all the kibbles from Petra uh, from up until 706 and 725. Crone debunked the land-based trade route theory. We debunked the sea-based trade ferry Mecca. And Gibson debunked the five stages of the Hajj in Mecca. Though Mecca has existed since the time of Adam and Eve, according to chapter 7, there is no evidence anywhere until 741 for the city. There's no reference to it. And everything we now find in Mecca, we could previously find in Petra in Jordan, 600 miles further north. But now we find even earlier in Jerusalem, seven to 800 miles further north. Conclusions, and I want to conclude now. Mecca is foundational for both Muhammad and the Quran. So without it, they both fall. References to Mecca in the Quran and traditions do not hold up historically as a center of history, geographically, like Ad Thamud and Midian, or linguistically, the Quranic Arabic is Nabataean, not Sabaic, which would have been in Mecca and Medina. Neither do the prophets supposedly buried there, nor the ancient maps of Ptolemy, nor the Qiblas of Gibson's research support an early Mecca. Neither the land trade route uh, on the Western Plateau, nor the Red Sea trade route along the African coast support an early Mecca. Topographical maps prove Mecca is off the Western Plateau and in a desert with no water. 
Thus the reason no civilization which has surrounded Arabia has heard of Mecca, as people and civilizations need water. The five stages of the Hajj, the Kaaba, Safa, Marwa, Arafat, Jamarat, Zamzam, and the Black Stone support Jerusalem, and except for the Black Stone and not Mecca, someone, somewhere, at some time, should have known about the city, yet no one anywhere nor at any time has, proving that it never existed at the time of Muhammad, nor during early Islam. Okay, back to you, Peter. Well, well, thank you very much, Jay. That's an incredibly uh, comprehensive and detailed uh, review of all the archaeology and the history. And I don't think I've heard you speak on this for a few years now, but it's fascinating to me that from the time I last heard you speak on this issue, uh, how much more material has uh, has come in, and uh, how this case has has been has been bolstered. The key question, I guess, is that if Mecca isn't backed up in as a real city before or up to the seventh century, you know, either in history or archaeology, then how did it rise to such a status? And who was behind that? Because, you know, as you've argued, it's it's uh, right at the heart of Islam. And in fact, there's no doubt that we do find, as you say, from the begin beginning of the Abbasid period in the mid eighth century, the 740s and 50s, we do find mosques starting to point to Mecca and pretty consistently to Mecca as they all do today. So. How did Mecca rise to such a status and, and who do you think was behind it? What's the evidence from history? Boy, I wish I had an hour to answer this question because this is the million dollar question that brings it all together. Let me see if I can do it in five minutes. In order to understand the importance of Mecca, you need to look and see what's happening on the ground historically, which is all documented. And what we do know is that the Umayyads come into power in 661, as we're gonna find next week, that we can follow just by looking at the coins and the rock inscriptions. We're going to shut that, shut down this notion that there were any people called Muslims or there was any religion called Islam or there was any book called the Quran in the 7th century, not in the mid 7th century, just by looking at the documents that were there. Now, what we do know from all the coins and from all the inscriptions uh, that exist, which do exist, and even the buildings that have inscriptions on, they all give us the story, the same story. And that is that Mu'awiyah up in Damascus, not in Mecca Medina. Remember, what's he doing way up in Damascus? He comes to power in 661. He is the one that brings all the Arabs together under one authority. He is a Christian, not a Muslim. We're going to see that next week. All his inscriptions have crosses on them. All the coins have crosses above his head holding crosses. How can he be a Muslim if he's, a, if he's holding a cross? So everything that's from the, from, the, from the 7th century shows us that these were Christians. He was a Christian in Damascus. Uh, he was part of the Sufyani family. The Marwanids take over in 685, 680, excuse me. They throw out Mu'awiyah. They are anti-Trinitarian Christians, but they're still Christians. They're Arianists, as we know as Arian from the 4th century. They are still, they're not, they don't call themselves Arianists. They still call themselves Christians, but they do not believe Jesus is God or the Trinity. And so the great, the greatest of all these is Abdul Malik. Abdul Malik comes to power in 685. He then builds the Dome of the Rock right there in Jerusalem. And we're going to see from the inscriptions on those are the everything attacking Jesus and attacking the Trinity. The, but what he does do is he does not get along with his governors. And one governor in particular is Ibn Zubair. Ibn Zubair rebels against him in 687. In Petra, he was the governor of Petra. That's why Petra is so important. And he destroys the Kaaba that's there. There was a Kaaba there because the Kaaba is the same word in Hebrew. It means, means cube. And people would circumambulate the cube in the, uh, Mount Moriah in Jerusalem the same way there in Petra. In destroying the Kaaba, he grabs the black stone. Ooh, doo -doo -doo. Remember I talked about the black stone. And he takes it down south. He, he stays in Petra to confront Al-Hajjaj, who is sent by Abdul Malik to shut down this rebellion. And he sends his women and children down to the south, down to his home place, which is what then be, later became Mecca. Here's the thing. When you take the black stone away, you take away God's presence. So where do you think the pilgrims went to? 
they no longer went to Petra because the Black Stone was no longer there. They followed the Black Stone boop, 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 down south. That's why Mecca had to be chosen. But who chose it? It in was Baghdad, the Abbasids who are now coming back into strength and the Umayyads who are weakening in strength in the 8th century. And they are, their headquarters is in Petra. Their, uh, that's, where their, uh, that's where their sanctuary is. The Abbasids, they need a sanctuary. And of course, they get in touch with Ibn Zubair and his descendants. And of course, where the Black Stone is, they then have an alliance with Ibn Zubair's uh, henchmen. And that's why then they then choose Mecca. Mecca gets chosen because the Black Stone is there. We're going to show you an inscription next week that points to exactly when the Masjid al-Haram was, was created. And it's the inscription that's in Saudi Arabia today, and we've only just discovered it. I put it up uh, on YouTube three weeks ago, no, two weeks ago. Uh, rocks never lie. 136,000 people have watched that video. It's only 11 minutes long. Go up on Fender Films. That is going viral because of this inscription, because it shows that this and that Mustil al Haram, which is the Kaaba today, that's that was built in 697. That fits perfectly with this scenario. So, mm -hmm. trying to get that, uh, I'm leaving out lots of material because I'm trying to sure. get it done in five minutes. Well, but just just to be clear, what you're suggesting is that what we know as the early uh, Islamic tradition in the seventh century was actually written, are you suggesting it was written retrospectively by the Abbasids because they moved the center of Islam from Petra down to Mecca and therefore had to create the story around that. that that's, that's coming next week. Thing. Yeah. That's okay. all coming to the next week. And I'll show you a graph that follows exactly what you've just said. Everything we know about Mecca, Muhammad, Quran, Islam, Muslim, all comes from the Abbasids. The Islam of today is an Abbasid invention then redacted back to the seventh century. And that's where they made all their mistakes. There's too much from the seventh century that shuts that down. And we'll get into that next week. Now, I guess a lot of people watching this webinar will be saying, look, I've never heard any of this stuff before. Uh, and if you're saying this is what scholarship is teaching, then uh, to what extent has it filtered down? I think of my own kids, Jay, when they went to a <clears> secondary <throat> school in a, a sunny, leafy uh, southeast English city uh, of, uh, about a decade or two ago and I remember them coming home with their workbooks and their maps and all of these showed Montgomery Watts trade trade routes and uh, having heard you speak way back then I asked them why do you think that when the Red Sea was there and they could have just gone up that with their boats uh, with all the ports on the west uh, being good deep water ports and water available, why did they why did they go across country? And so here in England, my kids were being taught Montgomery Watts version of events, which synchronizes, of course, resonates with the early Islamic traditions. So I guess my question is, to what extent is this scholarship, which in many ways is quite devastating to uh, a lot of the early traditions, to what extent is it filtering down and being taught in universities and schools and talked about on the media or, and so on? Or is it really still just really in, in the province of a few uh, university scholars? So just the very few. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and you know the answer why, uh, uh, Peter, for the very reason that you had to change the title of my talk today. That's the problem. You cannot say this openly except on YouTube. Uh, even those scholars who are writing this up, who are actually part of this whole, listen, almost every, almost everything I'm introducing, even today, you didn't know about the West Coast or those five ports until today, right? There's no one else that's done that research. We're doing that research. And that's why, we're, but it's all there. The research is there. The writers are writing it. The scholars are writing it, but they have seen what happened to other scholars like Patricia Corona. Look at the death threat she got. Look at John Wansborough. Look at, he got a death threat. Look at Samu Rushdie for the book he wrote. Uh, they're still trying to kill him. You don't live very long if you start introducing this kind of material in academia. So therefore, the academics are pushing it, they are doing it, but they're doing it usually with pseudonyms. And that's why we need to take it and get it out into the uh, out into the, the, the uh, to into the populist world. Uh, I'm, I'm that, there's no other reason why we're getting such huge hits. I can't understand 
why 136,000 people have watched just one inscription that gives the date for the Masjid al-Haram in just two weeks. That inscription's been there for decades. I knew about this back in 2010. I just didn't know the word. I didn't know how, I didn't bother to look at it more carefully, the Arabic. Now, can you see, this is going to, um, this is just going to make a life of its own. Now, let me just say this. Be careful how you use this material. Um, this is not hate speech. Nothing I've said today is hate speech. This is not Islamophobia. This is much more neutral. And that's why historical critical uh, questions like we're asking here, anybody can use, anybody, including Muslims and atheists and humanists. They love this material, but this really should be our material, Peter, because as Christians, we are the ones who've already had these very same questions thrown against the Bible, against Jesus Christ, against the historicity of the crucifixion and the resurrection. These have been thrown against us for 200 years, and we have answered every one of them using redacted criticism, source criticism, form criticism, historical criticism, textual criticisms. We didn't invent them, but it was using it on the Bible and Jesus that they were matured. So therefore, we not only have the right, we understand it better than anybody else, but we have all the right to ask these questions, none of which are Islamophobic, should not cause anybody anger. And I'm not getting death threats on YouTube, finally, because I'm not attacking Muhammad. I didn't say anything against Muhammad today. I'm not attacking Islam. I didn't say anything against Islam today. I'm not attacking his uh, is, uh, Muslims at all. I'm not saying anything against Muslims or the Quran against the violence or the, the sexual proclivity of Muhammad. I'm not saying any of that. I don't need to anymore. Throw that away and just ask a much deeper question. Did Mecca exist in the seventh century? Did Muhammad exist in the seventh century? And did the Quran exist? That's all I'm asking. That is so neutral and really takes the onus off my shoulders, which means anybody can use it. But can I just pick up that question about the origins of Christianity? Because you know, we're, we're in, uh, well, I'm in Europe today. You, you certainly spend a lot of your life here. You'll know that in Europe, we are living in largely a post-Christian society, and some of that, that is due to the, the influence of the theory of evolution, some of it's due to the, the Enlightenment, but also another big contributor to the loss of Christian faith in this continent was the criticism of the New Testament documents in the, in the uh, 19th century, and a lot of people came to the conclusion that the what that Christianity didn't really have uh, a, a, a historical and an archaeological base. And now, as, as you said, scholarship has turned that around over the last 150 years. Do you think it's possible that this criticism of, of, of Islam might also be turned around in the same way by subsequent scholarship, or is it looking a different kind of problem uh, than the one Christianity has? No, I would agree with you absolutely, Peter. Back in the 1800s, when this was first coming out in Germany and the University of Tübingen, Wellhausen and, and others, uh, scholars who are asking brilliant questions, you know, did uh, can we look at the first five books of Moses and say that they came from one author, the JEDP documentary, documentary hypothesis, so that can we know who, if Abraham ever existed? These, along with Darwinism, completely eradicated the, the, the authenticity for Christianities that melted down through the universities into the seminaries, from the seminaries down to the pews, so that by 1905, it decimated the church in Europe, and the church has never recovered in Europe, as you well know. Since 1905, we've found answers to every one of these questions. That's why we're so good at this, and that's why, in some ways, this really should be Christians who are using it, because we've now been able to find, well, look at the New Testament documentation, the enormous amount of manuscript evidence for the New Testament. 10,000 Latin Vulgates, we've now found 8,600 Greek manuscripts, we found another 9,000 uh, 9, from other manuscripts from other languages, making up 24,000 manuscripts of just the New Testament alone. Well, many of them are from the fourth century on, but even the manuscript evidence, just the historic, the historicity of who Jesus was, what he said, where he did. Look at the geographical locations, 105 geographical locations in just the book, uh, just the, uh, the four gospels and the book of Acts, proving 
that we've got the right man at the right place doing the right thing at the right time, written by people that actually knew him or those that got it from those who knew him. As we're going to see next week, Islam has nothing along this level. Now, so that's why in some way we have come back and we are now able to say categorically, we know who Jesus was. We know what he did. We know what he said. We know where he died. We know where he rose again. These are the things that, and, and that's all you need to say, because once you say those five things, pretty much you, you've got the gospel well documented and solidified historically. And that's all we're asking. If we can solidify our Lord Jesus Christ and what he did and said, why cannot Islam do the same? Or don't just stop at Islam. The Mormons have to do this. The Hindus have to do this with the Bhagavad Gita, the Vedas, the Upanishads, anybody, any religious uh, uh, any religion that makes historical claims has to fast the historical test. We're asking this of Islam, but everything that I'm asking has already been done to the Bible. And that's why it makes it so easy for me. Now, th this raises another question, which Alex is asking from a, a North African Islamic context. And, and he's saying, you know, thanks for your presentation, Jay. His question is, have you discussed this with Muslim scholars and what, what's their take on it? And what's the best way to discuss this with Muslims? Well, in debate, we appreciate that's what I, that in some contexts it might be very difficult to discuss this with Muslims. But but uh, tell us a bit about Muslim scholars and how they're reacting to this material. Yeah. Now this this material, no Muslim will debate me on. I mean, I love to do debates, as you well know, Peter. I've done over a hundred debates with Muslim scholars, mostly on the Quran, because the Quran they will debate. And um, I'm going to be, I can't say where I'm going to be. I'll be in a few months. I'll be in parts of Africa, uh, in Nigeria. Well, I can say that. And also in South Africa, where I'll be doing debates for the first time on Mecca and on Muhammad. Because so far here in the West, they will not debate it. You can see why. How would you debate what I've just presented today? How would a Muslim debate that? Because in order to debate it, they're going to have to come up with seventh century evidence. Everything I'm using is from the seventh century or earlier and parts a little bit of the 8th century. I don't care about the 9th and 10th century. I've pretty much, I've dismissed the 9th and 10th century, but every Muslim is going to have to come back. That's the problem. You cannot, and that's why this is really a Western uh, discussion. This is not a discussion you should have in North Africa. This is not a discussion you have should have in any Muslim uh, majority country. Just stay away from this. Let us do that. This is our job. And that's what I'm talking about is uh, Europeans, Americans, those of us who have the freedom in the West to still have these kind of debates. Now, as far as historic, what has happened, I mean, let me just give you an example of one debate I had in 2014, which you remember, Peter, with Dr. Shabir Ali on the six major manuscripts, um, which I'm going to introduce in three weeks. That one debate, I know of, uh, I know of at least 200 people that have come to the Lord because of that one debate. I just met a man just last, uh, just on Monday. What is today? Thursday? Three days ago. He, he, he's all over the internet. His name is Adam Seeker. I won't say what country he's from, but he grew up as a Salafi Muslim, is a Hafiz. He memorized the entire Quran by heart. He watched that debate in 2018, left Islam after that debate, became a Christian, is now one of our best debaters. He is amazing. He reads and writes uh, Punjabi, Urdu, Hindi, English, and Arabic, all five languages, ha has the entire Quran memorized in his head, and he's now using this material. He has baptized 100 Muslims in just the last year, all using that debate, just one debate. So that's how you can use it. You can use it in debate form, or you can just send people to the debate. Now, the Quran is much easier than any other because it is in our hand today. You will see that when I talk and unpack it. It is much easier to use than, say, Mecca or Muhammad, because Mecca, we can't go back to the seventh century, but we can with the Quran. That's why it's beautiful, and that's why it's amazing, and that's why it's so easy to use, especially for those of you who are doctors or nurses. You're going into Muslim countries. You have, you're going with an awful lot of clout. Uh, and you have an enormous amount of, of authority that the rest of us do not have. So you can bring these up into conversations or just have them go and look at the debates that we're doing for them on YouTube. Now, if every Christian listening to this, and we're almost out of time now, but I just wanted to ask you this. Every Christian listening to this will be reflecting on their own journey. And uh, many of us weren't brought up in Christian uh, homes. We, we came from another faith background or from an atheist background or, or, or whatever. 
And uh, at some point in our journey towards Christ, if we're coming from another faith background, we have we start often by beginning to doubt what we've always believed, what our strong convictions were. Uh, how how important do you think uh, this uh, material is in uh, helping Muslims to reflect on what they've all, already passionately believed and uh, perhaps to, to start to have doubts about it, which might make them more open to uh, a Christian perspective? I guess the best way to answer that, Peter, is just by taking the same things I've just introduced today, what I'm going to introduce next week, and then apply it to Christianity. What if I came up and I showed you categorically that I can have evidence after evidence from the first century that there was nobody named Jesus, that there was no city called Jerusalem, and that there was no reference to any scripture at all until the third century? That's what I'm saying. We have yeah. nothing. I have not got into that yet. That's going to uh, unpack next week. What would you do as a Christian if Jesus, Jerusalem, and the Bible did not exist till the third century? How would you defend it? And what would that do to your faith? Well, you'd be absolutely devastated, wouldn't you? Bingo. And even more so for Muslims, because though we know that Though we know that Jesus talks to us personally, so those of us who have a relationship with Jesus already know him personally, Islam doesn't have that. They don't have any personal relationship with Allah or Muhammad. Therefore, they have to have the book, the man in the place. Those are the only three that, make, that, that give authority to everything they believe. Unlike us, who have a personal relationship, they don't. So can you see why this is so much more devastating to Islam and why the Muslims get so angry and why you are not permitted to attack or criticize Muhammad or the Quran? Why do you think those two laws are in Pakistan and all over the Muslim world? You cannot criticize those two things, obviously, because those two things are absolutely sacrosanct for Muslims because they know that with if those two get criticized, Islam falls. Well, thank you very much, Jay. We have sadly run out of time. Let me just remind you too that uh, this is the second of a series of four talks that Jay is giving. So the first one was on the hermeneutical key a few weeks ago. If you missed that, it's on our website. And let me encourage you to go and listen to that talk because it gets right to the heart of that very issue that Jay has just mentioned, that the, the, the relationship being at the very heart of Christianity as opposed to uh, Islam and the idea of God walking among us in, in the book of uh, Genesis and the Garden of Eden. So go back and listen to that, the hermeneutical key. And then we've got two more talks coming up on, on in the same series of understanding Islam. The next one is on the prophet Muhammad, which will be next week, the 15th of June, same time, same place. And then uh, the one after that is two weeks later, when we look at the Quran and the manuscript evidence for it. So it remains to me again, Jay, to say thanks very much. And thank you to all of you for coming along. And we look forward to seeing you again soon on ICMDA webinars. May the Lord bless you.